you let's stand all together and let's worship him he is exalted the king is exalted on high I will praise him Exalted forever, exalted and I will praise His name. For He is the Lord, forever His truth shall reign. Heaven and earth rejoice in His hope.
Let's remember our pastor and brother Mark Jones in prayers. And would you come to pray, brother? Amen. You happy to be here tonight? Amen. Good to see you, Philip, Ruth, and Leah. I hadn't got to see you, so congratulations on your engagement. So, so happy. I've known Ruth for many years. Very happy for her. Amen. It's always a good step to find your mate. Amen. Truly is. Appreciate y'all being with us, all the visitors. Remember Brother Joseph. Let's continue with remember Sister Debbie and Sister Judith. And let's remember Brother Pat. He said something. I got something in his eye today. Let's remember him in prayer tonight. Let's just go to him in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord. Lord, once again, Lord, we find ourselves... Lord, in a, in a place, Lord, that we can worship you, Lord. Lord, in a place that we've assembled together and took this time apart, Lord, to sing of your praises, Lord, and to sing of your goodness, to lift our hands and to worship you, Lord, and we're so appreciative. We're so thankful, Lord. Lord, many miracles standing amongst us, Lord Jesus, and many things, Lord, that you've already moved from us, Lord. But Lord, now we're sitting here tonight, Lord, Sister Debbie, Lord, Sister Judith, Lord, Brother Pat and his eye, Lord Jesus, our pastor, Lord, as he travels, Brother Mark, you see each one of them, Lord, and we send your Holy Spirit for him, Lord. We ask you to be with them in a mighty way, Lord. We ask you to touch them, Lord, to be with them, Lord. Those that are missing tonight, Lord, Lord, be with them tonight, wherever they would be. Bring us back together, Lord. Bring us into your worship. But Lord, tonight, Lord, take control of this service, Lord. Be with my brother Roger, Lord. Lead him in such a way, Lord, to sing the songs of Zion, Lord, to worship your holy name. Be with brother Ben, Lord. We can, Lord, come tonight, Lord, expecting something great, Lord. Lord, we expect your word to be spoken. We expect it to encourage us. Lord, we ask you to come fulfill that tonight, Lord. Only you can do that. Lord, you're welcome in this place. Receive our worship is our prayer. Lord, we love you. We give you honor. We do all these things in your lovely name, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Congratulations, Brother Phil and Sister Ruth. Thank you. 
you feel his presence here? Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Every praise is to our God. Every word of worship. invite the offering and Amen. 
Well, the offering comes. Let's sing. Sing. I will praise the Lord. I will praise the Lord. No matter what tomorrow brings or what He has in store. Let's worship him. Um, let's worship him like the people of Israel conquered Jericho. Yeah. Amen. God's no dead. He is alive. God is not dead. He is alive. God is not dead. He is alive, I feel him in my hands, I feel him in my feet, I feel him in my heart, I feel him all over me. God is not dead, he's still alive, God is not dead, he is alive. I feel him alone. God is not dead. He is alive. God is not dead. He is alive. God is not dead. He is alive. I feel him in my hands. I feel him in my feet. I feel him in my heart. I feel him all over me. Oh, when the saints go marching in, oh, when the saints go marching in, Lord, I want to be in the number when the saints go marching in. Oh, when the saints. Go marching in, 
when the saints go marching Lord, I want to be in the number when the saints go marching in. And when the sun begins to shine, and when the sun begins to shine, Lord, I want to be in the number when the saints go marching. Oh, when they sing, go marching in. Oh, when they sing, go marching in. Lord, I want to be in the number. When they sing, go marching in. Glory, glory. the preacher comes amazing grace shall always be my song of praise praise the Lord
everything we are, yes. everything we'll ever be, to see some part of us that he considered to be special, important. You are a VIP, a very important person. Did you know yes. that? God looks at you as a very important creature. Without you, there would be no bride. Without you, there would be no rapture. Without you, there would be no resurrection. So whether you realize it or not, you have value in the eyes of God. That's why he's given everything he's got for us. I love him. I love him. Don't you love him? Good to be in the house of the Lord tonight. God bless you. If you have your Bible this evening, let's turn to Luke chapter 13, verse 27. I want to say what a privilege it is to be gathered here tonight in the uh, house of the Lord. I want to thank Brother Joseph for inviting us to come and be in the uh, service this evening. Take the service tonight and I sure appreciate the Lord giving us the opportunity to be here. Amen. I um, was happy to see Ruth and Leah and Philip. God bless you all. It's good to see you tonight. Amen. All the visitors, everybody around. I think Brother Jonathan greeted you already, but we're going to give you a double portion and greet you again. Amen. And welcome to the house of the Lord. And, and uh, somebody will probably shake your hand and tell you welcome after that. So you just keep getting blessed each time. Amen. If you're visiting. So we thank you for turning the Bible. Now let's start with the message I want to use the um, subject here, uh, take Luke 13 and Matthew 12, and I want to do a negative and a positive on both sides of this. And the reason I want to grab these two scriptures is for the basis of my title, which is the fear of being rejected and the joy of being accepted. Amen. The fear of being rejected and the joy of being accepted. So let's look at the negative side first, the rejected part. Luke chapter 13, verse 27. And he shall say, I tell you, I know you not whence you are. Depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity. Depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity. Now the word he uses here for depart is to draw away, fall away, cause to withdraw, to remove, or withdraw from one. So depart or withdraw, remove, go away, separate, fall away. As Paul told us, there'd be a great falling away in the last day. 
Now, Matthew chapter 12, verse 21. Now, here's the positive side. And in his name shall the Gentiles trust. I like that. The word trust here means hope, things hoped for. Sound familiar to anybody? Hebrews 11.1, faith is the substance of things hoped for. To wait for salvation with joy and full confidence. With joy and full confidence. The fear of being rejected and the joy of being accepted. Amen. Can we pray together tonight over the word? While your heads are bowed this evening, if you'd just like to be remembered in prayer, just let it be known by the lifting of your hand if you would. God bless you. My hand's up too. Lord Jesus, we count it a privilege to be gathered here in the house of the Lord. As we bow our head to you, Lord Jesus, we are so grateful to have the privilege of standing here in the divine presence of the Holy Spirit. And Lord Jesus, as we are now opening the Word of God, that we might be able to look into the depth of the Word of God. We're asking that you, who is the author of this book, the Bible, will come tonight and will quicken the word, that you'll make it alive to us, that you will move upon the scene to take what would be said here tonight and shape it and form it into something that will be for your glory and to get glory unto yourself, and that we might be benefited by our gathering together here tonight. And Lord Jesus, any man can open this Bible, but Heavenly Father, only you and you alone can open the contents of this book. So, Father, we're praying you'll come tonight and speak to us in a special way as we ask you to move upon every life. You see every uplifted hand here tonight. Lord Jesus, you see all of the requests that has went before the platform this evening and before the people. We pray that you'll be mindful of everything as we commit the service to you, both speaker and listener, in the name of Jesus Christ. And the saint said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. May the Lord bless you real good. So appreciate the Lord tonight. And uh, what a privilege it is to be gathered together in the house of the Lord. One thing that I want to call your attention to is the reading there in Matthew chapter 12 when he speaks about confidence or trust. And I've got 16 articles of faith and fear that I want to cover tonight, the Lord helping us. And many of these are little snippets of scriptures and things. So when you hear 16, don't be afraid that we're going to be here for three hours. And um, uh, hopefully the Lord help me, I get through this an hour. If I talk fast and preach fast and you listen fast, we'll get through most of this tonight. But the Lord helping us, I want to try to show you through these 16 articles of faith and fear, what it means to have a fear of being rejected, but also what it means to have joy in being accepted. Because Brother Brenham teaches us that there's only two elements that govern humanity. He said one of those is faith and the other one is fear. It is impossible to have a total complete faith if fear is present in your walk with God. And on the other side of it, it is entirely impossible to have fear if you've got a complete and total faith in your walk with God. So you cannot mix these elements together and choose one over the other or uh, I'll I'll be a little of this and 10% of that and 90% of that and I'll have more faith than I will fear. It doesn't work that way. You either have one element or you have the other. Now in looking at the scriptures we read here, especially Luke chapter 13, those are words that none of us ever want to hear. The idea of being rejected by God is enough sometimes to send people into a place of just almost panic and hysteria. The very thought that God would look upon them and the elements of their heart and what they're all about on their secret parts of who they are and not so much what people see outside but what they are on the inside and that God would see that and in turn reject them because of that something that lay on the inside that may not be pure, may not be clean, may not be right with God. If you are a sensible thinking person, that scares you until you couldn't sleep. Now, what would alleviate that fear? Well, then, of course, on the other side of it is then in Matthew chapter 12. If a person can immerse themselves in the revelation and the understanding that they can have full, perfect, total, sound confidence in God accepting them as being a product of God, a son of God, daughter of God, a child of God in general, then by having that confidence, then it removes the fear 
of being rejected. Now, I want to tell you something. In my years of ministry, there's always been these two conversations that come up when you're talking to people, especially when you get on conversations about the Holy Ghost. And what you find out is that when a person is not really sure that they're that they're born again in any way whatsoever, there is an element of fear that lays within their heart that, oh my, I'm going to be foolish virgin, I'm going to miss the rapture, Uh, something God's going to come up to the end and I'm going to be thrown out. But that fear of being rejected cannot coexist with the joy of being accepted. Because you see, once you are accepted, you have no more fear of being rejected. Well, you say then, Brother Ben, how's the secret of all of this come together? It comes to the personal revelation inside of your heart that you have been accepted by Almighty God with all your faults, with all your mistakes, with all your failures, with everything that you are as a human being, all of your strains, all of the things that pass down from your mom, your granddad, and everybody else, and yet God sees all of that in you, but yet still accepts you as being a part of his beloved kingdom. Once that, that joy settles in there, then there's no way that a person could walk into the elements of, the, the, of rejection or the fear of being rejected. Now, if we are to trust God, I want you to look at that again in Matthew chapter 12, verse 21. Notice, in his name shall the Gentiles trust. Now, notice again, this is things that are hoped for. The very same words that Paul uses again in Hebrews 11, 1, when he said that faith is our substance of things that we hope for. Now, I'm going to show you in just a little bit that God wants us to be a hopeful people, but he doesn't want us to be hopeful alone, just singularly hopeful without any foundation. Because remember, hope in itself is just an expectation that has no foundation. It's something that you're looking forward to. You're not really sure if it's going to happen. Uh, It might, it might not, it could, could not. But once hope is tied or married to faith, then the foundation of faith will birth from that hope a, a reality or a joy that you are accepted in God's beloved. But until that settles inside of your heart, there's absolutely no way whatsoever that you can escape the fear of knowing that one day God could look right down on you and say, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. Now, I'm going to say something very bold. I hope this doesn't shake nobody. And if it does, I hope it shakes you in a good way. But there are going to be many people around the ranks of this message that have lived and followed Brother Branham. They've lived in the auspice of this message and yet they've never come to that place of a true revelation from God that they are born again, that they are ready for the rapture, that God has placed his seal of approval on their life and one day they will stand before almighty God and they will stand at the white throne of judgment and he will look at them and say I want you to depart, go away withdraw, fall away from me, I never knew you whatsoever. Now brother that's a reality And many of them will probably say, well, I believe the prophet, I believe the message, I preach the gospel, I pastor the church, I evangelize around the world. And he'll say, that doesn't matter. What mattered was your relationship and the revelation that you have been accepted, hallelujah, in the beloved of God. Until that settles in, forget about it, you're not going to have any confidence. Amen. I don't care how many messages you read or how many things you listen to. Until this settles into your heart, you're still floating around with just hope. Amen. But hope must be tied to faith. Now, let's look at our first article here. And I'll try to dig right into this quickly so not to waste any time getting down to the elements of this. But our first article of faith and fear is we must have confidence in him to hear our prayers. Now, let's let's, let's just look at that again. We must have confidence in him to hear our prayers. Now, for a foundation for this, I want to look at 1 John chapter 2, verse 28. Now, I want you to listen to this the way John said this. I love this, this, this um, uh, not so much an example, but this statement, this remark from John here. He says, Now, little children. Now, I want you to realize that when the Bible addresses us as children, it is addressing us as, in other words, he's saying that as a child, we are a believer at every stage in our walk with God. Because remember, you cannot be a child unless you have been birthed by a father. That's what makes you a child, is that you are a progeny of a father. Remember what Jesus said when he prayed the Lord's Prayer. He didn't say, my father, but he said, our father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
So when the Bible, Brother Colby, addresses us as a child, it is identifying that we are a believer at every stage in the journey of God. Because you see, faith and doubt cannot coexist. If I'm a believer and you are a believer, there is no way I can have a revelation that God's word is right, that this message is true, and have doubt inside of my heart. If I do, I'm not a child. If I do, I'm not born again by the Holy Ghost, and I don't care what their name is or what church they belong to, until that doubt has been purged out of their life, I don't care how long they preach or how long they've been a Christian, as they might think of it, until that is gone, they have not been born again by the Holy Ghost. Because only a man or a woman that has full confidence in the revelation of the Word of God is a child and them alone. Amen. Can you say amen tonight? Oh, thank you, Jesus. Now, remember, little children means you are a believer at every stage. Now, watch John said, abide in him that when he shall appear, we may have confidence. Now, the word confidence, as it shows up in the Greek many times, will have different meanings and variations to the word confidence. And quite simply, it's a perfection of a perfect confidence. It is having boldness. It is having an ability to speak without concealment. An ability to speak without concealment. In other words, when I go before God, I don't have to hide little things. I don't have to shove little things off in the corner or cloak little areas of my life and say, well, now, Lord, uh, you know, I love you and I believe you, but, but you know, just, just ignore this little thing over here. Uh, maybe I would want to hide or, uh, you know how it is sometimes when people have got little things in their life, whenever they're running around town and maybe they've come from the gymnasium or somewhere like that and they're wearing clothes that they ought not be wearing <laughs> praise the lord somebody I, I realize one thing you can be a christian anywhere you go just because you're not in church don't mean you have to go around your leotards and your tights and your shorts Praise the Lord, somebody. Amen. And they got little things they want to hide. Well, you know, and they see a believer, of course, in Walmart or whatever. And, of course, you know, they don't want anybody to see them, so they'll run the other direction or they'll, they'll dodge out this direction or whatever. But remember, that is concealment, trying to cloak or hide a public sin. And Paul, excuse me, John is saying that when we come before God with this word confidence, that we do not have to conceal one area of our heart. Remember, the prophet taught us that there are many doors inside of your heart. There's a door of faith, a door of pride, a door of this, a door of that. And when we are wide open before the Lord Jesus, we do not have to hide not one thing. I don't have to hide my private life. I don't have to hide my faith from Him. I don't have to hold back elements of my life. I can be wide open and have perfect confidence. When I'm standing before him, he sees every area of my life and I'm not afraid for him to look into my heart. You understand when a person has this kind of fear, that they're scared of what God might see, that is the fear of being rejected. But when you have been washed by the Holy Ghost, you're not afraid at all. Hey, I don't care what kind of mistakes you made or what kind of errors you make or how much you flip-flop or this, that, and the other. When you have truly been born again of the Holy Ghost. Come on, somebody. When the Holy Spirit has anchored on the inside of you, there is no fear. Of what God might find on the inside of you. Sure there's fear. You, don't, you, you know he sees your humanity and your weaknesses and your frailties. But as far as your heart goes, there is no fear of what is hiding inside of that soul. Now if we've got that kind of trust, that firm trust, the dictionary says. Or that perfect confidence or the boldness or the openness or like this, the fearlessness. This is why Paul said, when you come up before the throne of grace, come boldly. I don't have to come up, oh, oh God, please don't kill me. Uh, please don't destroy me, Lord. I, I'm a worm. I'm a snake. I'm rotten. I'm good for nothing. Why, why do you want to talk to your daddy that way? You're a child. Why don't you address yourself properly? Woo, come on, preach to me now. When you're standing in the presence of the Lord, why don't you talk to him the way that he looks at you? Quit calling yourself scum. Quit calling yourself dirt. When you come before his presence, why don't you say to him what he knows about you? Father, I am your child. 
I am your bride. I am your wife. I am your son. I am your daughter. And I approach you, hallelujah, as a son, as a daughter, as a child. I approach you by the grace of Almighty God. I come boldly before your throne. Friends, you understand, I don't mean to say this in an ugly way. I realize that when it comes to really moving in the Holy Spirit, sometimes we got to travail. I get that. Sometimes we got to cry out, ball, squall, holler, and everything else. But you know, there is a line there. When you see people start crossing the line between that, and then every time they come before God, they have to go into that begging mode. You know what I'm talking about? Where every time they come to God, oh, oh God, please, please, Lord, uh, if I found favor in your sight, uh, uh, if I've been a good girl this week or a good boy, oh, oh, oh God, uh, 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 Lord, you, you understand what's going on. You don't have a revelation, not a real one, of who you really are when you approach him in that manner. Friends, nothing against youth camps, but this is one reason why a lot of these camp meetings, a lot of these meetings, why that I say I like to see what happens after the camp meeting to see what really took place in the camp meeting. Because it is easy in special meetings and all these type of things to fall under the anointing of running to the altar and screaming and shouting and hollering and carrying on. I'm going to tell you some young people will scream at Louisiana and BYC and come here at church and sit like a stump. Amen. You know what it goes to prove? And I'm not throwing off on any of our young people or any young person at all. I'm saying that we're getting under an atmosphere of like beggars. Oh God, uh, I'm privileged in this atmosphere to have a touch of your presence. So I better get all I get because I might not get any more. Are you kidding me? Once you recognize who you are, it is an unlimited revival. There is not a day of your life that the Holy Ghost cannot have poured out His oil. Amen. Amen. Come on, somebody. Every day of your life, the Holy Ghost can pour out on you like that. You don't just have to get stimulated when Brother Brooks or, or, or some other preacher comes by and sings real loud and we beat the piano real fast. We are not beggars if we are children. And I do not need the scraps from a revival. To keep me going tomorrow. Woo. <laughs> I, look, I don't mean no harm. I believe in them. Look, I sent my daughter to camp this year. I got saved in a youth camp. I'm not against them. What I'm against is this modern day push of Pentecost, Pentecostalism that we've got around the ranks of our message that make people feel like if you jump so high, you got it. You can jump and still go to hell. You can shout and still go to hell. I'm preaching whether you say amen or not. Amen. You can run up here and cry and holler, but until you recognize I am a son, I have been accepted, I am a part of the beloved, I don't care how you holler, I don't care how you shout, I don't care how you scream or beg, until you come there, God will not take that fear out of your heart of being rejected. You must have confidence that God hears your prayers. If you don't have confidence that he can hear your prayers, you are fighting at the air. You are beating like you're punching out in the air. You're not going to accomplish not one thing. Oh, and adults, we're the same way. We say, well, Lord, I'll just come here and sit down in church. Praise the Lord. I guess I'll just get what little crumbs I can get tonight. Do you realize that the element of a preacher's gift is controlled by your hunger? Sure it is. I remember, I remember some years there for the years that we did the Bible study in Manchester on Monday night. Eight years. Traveled out there and sat down on Monday night and would teach the Bible study. And Ruthie and some of these young people was in this. And when we'd sit down and t- teach this Bible study, I'd have a whole list of things. Sometimes 30 pages of stuff we're going to talk about. And I'd start turning pages. By the time I got it about page three and a half, I was completely in another universe. Amen. And you know what I used to tell them, folks? You know why that is? Because of your hunger for some truth. You are pulling a gift in a direction to meet your need. Now, what makes you think here tonight that you're the one that can, that, that I'm the one that controls my gift when it's actually you? And you realize if you've got a need tonight, a need, a legitimate, genuine need from God, and you recognize that you are a child, you can pull on your heavenly Father, and my gift will obey His will, and He will pull my body in subjection to your need. And you can get whatever you ask for. You do not have to just accept whatever's going to be said. I mean, if you're in a financial need and the preacher's going to preach on love before he knows that he'll be having a series on finances. Woo, come on. 
Because you are the one that pulls that need out of God. <laughs> so we must have confidence that he hears our prayers. We must have confidence that he hears our prayers. First John chapter 3 verse 20. Now notice this very far. Heart condemn us. Now notice the condemning is a present insincerity. That accompanies a heart that's got a sin in it. Something that's unconfessed. Something that's not made right. Now all of us sitting here, me included, have, just, have done blunders with zeros on the end of it. <laughs> We've bankrupted the, gra- the, the bank of grace sometimes. Trying the best to say, God, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And you actually reach a place at some time in your life and you walk with God and you think, well, what's use? God knows I messed up, so I just keep going on and just go. If you do that, that sin will lay there. And it will be something that when you pray will sit before you every time you go to ask him of anything. And until you repent for it, it will lay right there. Oh, praise the Lord. Amen. Husbands and wives, you know the Bible talks about things like this. If you all get a little thing against each other, don't let the sun go down. Don't let say, well, I do what I want to and she can just go on to bed. Uh Uh-huh. The Bible said that as long as you've got a little thing there between you and her, God won't even hear you pray until you go straighten it out. Woo! Glory. Amen. Yes, sir. It is a it is a condemning that is not a condemning unto death or a condemning unto hell, but it is a condemnation that strikes your heart in the form of guilt. It lets you know I've done this wrong. I need to make this right. Now watch. He said. Then he said, if our heart condemns us not, then we have confidence toward God. That's the openness and that's the fearlessness that we have. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of Him because we keep His commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. We can ask him whatever we want to ask him. If our heart doesn't condemn us, we can go right before the presence of the Lord and say, God, I lay my life out before you. You say, well, I've done it again and again. Well, that's okay. Just keep repenting again and again and again and again and again and again. Could you imagine, amen, a little bitty fish about that long, Brother Jesse, sitting in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, say, I better not drink too much. I might run out of water. Well, Brother Benham said, that's what God's grace has. And God's mercy looks like to you and I. So go on and repent anyhow. And ask him to forgive you. Because there's much more grace than there is your mistake. Amen. Hallelujah to God. 1 John chapter 5 now verse 14. Remember we must have confidence that God can hear our prayers. Again and this is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything. I know sometimes when it goes to asking God about things, we're kind of sparing. Well, uh, Lord, uh, I- I'd just like you to help me with this flat tire. Why not pray for a new car? Oh, why? Fear, huh? Well, what if God, what, tells you no? Then if you're a Christian, his nose is as good as his yes, so you're okay with that. Why have fear when all you're looking for is his answer? Remember, a no is an answer. Well, God, I, I, need, I need, he knows exactly what we need. He's just waiting on us to ask him. That's what Brother Man taught us. He told us that if you've got a need, all you have to do is ask of God. And God will see to it that you get the thing met. Amen. If it's in his will, if it's according to his desires, if it's not something that breaks the word, God has no problem answering your prayers. But we're afraid to ask him. Why? The fear of being rejected. Why well, would we be afraid of that? If he tells me no, that's clear. Okay. No. Sure. Great, Lord. Next. Moving on. Words amen in case you all forgot it. Oh, I know. We like that preaching that gives us everything we want when we want it. Sometimes God shakes his head no. And you know what? You've got to be comfortable with that. I am okay. If God tells me I can't have it, I'm okay with that. I figure he knows the end of the road. I can't see the future. I don't know what tomorrow's going to be. I know what my routines are and I know how I like to do things, but that doesn't mean that it's going to be exactly just that way. God may change the whole program tomorrow. I could be in Africa by this time tomorrow night. I don't know. Come on, somebody. We don't know exactly what's going to happen from day to day. So if you ask of God and he shakes his head, no. I'm okay with that. Fine. Fine, Lord. That's what you want. That's what you want. If I believe he will answer my prayer, 
then I'm not looking for it to be always in the affirmative. I'm looking for it to be confirmative. It's not even a word, I don't think, but I like the way it sounded. I want him to confirm what I'm saying. God, I'm asking you to do something for me. God, like Paul, I prayed three times, asking God to heal his eyes. And God, nope, sorry, Paul. My grace is sufficient for you. Paul said, okay. You never find anywhere in the scripture he ever prayed again. Why? As a child, he was okay with what daddy told him. Woo, thank you, Jesus. My, this is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will. So this ain't blab it and grab it, name it and claim it. That's the Joel Osteen version of this. God wants to bless you greater than you've ever been blessed. Yeah, and that might look like a whole handful of trials. That might be your car breaking down and your bank account being robbed and somebody stepping on your big toe. Come on now. God may want to bless you all right, but it might be the blessings of great tensions. <laughs> Woo, thank you, Lord. Right, might be a blessing in a different manner than what you're looking for. Mm, mm, mm. Now, notice, he will answer our petitions that we desire. Now, notice again, I love this. and uh, He makes a statement like this in, in the 15th verse there. If we know that he hear us. Listen. If we know that he hear us. If we know that he hear. Don't, don't you understand? You must have a confidence. God has accepted me. And when he accepts me, he hears my prayers. Oh, glory. Whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desire of him. Now, notice this article number two. God will accept our repentance based upon the sincerity of our soul. No matter what the marks may be in our body. Now, let me explain this one for just a moment. Let's say you're coming in off the street and you're a drug addict. If you are sincere before God, God does not look at how much dope that you've been taking. God doesn't look at how your lungs have been eat up with cancer, marijuana, your liver eat up with cirrhosis from alcohol. God does not judge you based on the tattoos that you got when you was in the world or the holes that you got in your ears from all them earrings. He bases his salvation upon the condition and sincerity of your soul. <laughs> Oh, listen to this. I like to have a shout and fit when I read this this morning. Look, Brother Bam was talking about in faith in God, that little woman. Remember in Memphis when he met the little mammy? And the little boy was laying there in the bed with social disease. They tell him there's not a chance for the boy to live. He said, all right. He said, now, I talked to him for a little while, and I said, son, would you become a Christian? He said, I want to, Brother Branham, but I'm afraid that God won't receive me. Now, friends, I wonder tonight, how many in the message of the hour, how many in this church is sitting right in the same place this young man was sitting in right here? You really want to dive into being a real Christian, but you are afraid that God will see the real you. And he'll reject you because really only you know you. Everybody else may think they know you, but really only you really knows you. And let's just be honest. A lot of times we are dead ashamed of who we know we really are. And so because we know that, because that's easy for us to get. Nobody has to preach that to us, but the force we know it already. Our own conscience, our own life, our, our, our inside parts, our thoughts, this, that, and the other. It all speaks to an element of, of shame. So because of that, we are afraid that God will reject us. Now, brother, this is where I hope you understand that the power of the holy blood of Jesus Christ, once it has ever been applied to your soul, you may see your ugliness, but God don't see your ugliness. <laughs> I read today where Brother Bam said, God became ugly that we could become beautiful. Oh, hallelujah. Notice this young man, he said, I've been so sinful. I said, oh, yes, he will. Oh, yes, sir, he will receive you. He said, you think he would take me and me with a disease like this? You remember when Brother Bram was talking about that little prostitute that bowed down, kissed his feet, washed his feet with her hair. He dramatized it in 1963 and he said that when she was going up to her apartment to get the money to buy the alabaster box, 
He said she stopped for a moment and said, I can't give him this. He'll know how I got this money. But God accepts us based on the sincerity of our soul, not the marks in our body. Do you realize some of you sitting here tonight that Brother Branham taught that if you boys ever kiss a girl, you are morally obligated to marry that person. When you hug a person, another, uh, 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 another sex, when you hug a woman, you boys, and back and forth, man hug woman, woman hug man, Brother Branham said leaves an imprint upon them. Now, I won't ask you to raise your hands, but I'm sure that the remark I just made hits home somewhere. And so you might be thinking, well, how could God ever accept me? I mean, maybe take a person that has lost their virginity altogether. How could God ever receive me in any way? Because God is not basing it upon the marks in your flesh, but upon the sincerity of your soul. Hallelujah. That gives drug addicts, prostitutes, whoremongers. It gives everybody a little bit of hope, friends. Take a fellow in this day and age. I've often wondered how some of these creatures out here that's got tattoos even on their eyelids. Can you imagine? Gauges in their ears and their earlobes that hang down and about this big around. I always wonder, what happened if that fellow just get an earth-shaking experience of God and receive the Holy Ghost tonight? God called him to be a preacher. I mean, we've seen ties flop around, but what about earlobes? Tattoos all over his face, all over his arms, all over whatever. And say, my, look at him, isn't he a horrible looking thing? But God didn't receive him based upon the marks of his body or the cleanliness thereof. But upon the sincerity of his soul. Come on, somebody. Amen, that gives us hope. Gives us hope. Notice now, I love this. We must hold our confidence, the next article, of him to have our best interest at heart. This is one of my favorites. We must recognize that God has got your best interest in his heart. All he has cared about, all all God even is concerned with, is your best interest. And yet many times when it comes to serving the Lord, we look at him almost in a fearful way. Like God standing over us with a rod of iron. The very first mistake we make, he's going to blast us and send us to hell. And it's actually not that way at all. Actually, God has got your best interest in heart. He is concerned about what you're concerned with. Don't you realize when he resurrected the little fish out there, Dale Hollow? Amen. Just an hour down the road, just a few minutes up from where my granddad and my dad's people come from. We cross that bridge. I tell my girls every time we go over there, this is where God resurrected that little fish. They say, why, daddy? Why? I said, because God wanted you to know that he cared about the little things just like he did the big things. We must hold confidence in Him to have our best interest in heart. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 12. In whom we have boldness and access, glory, with confidence by the faith of Him. Glory. This word access is actually a relationship whereby we are acceptable to Him. Glory to God. I hope you got that. We have got access. Not that God just opened up the door and said, all right, come on in. I'm just going to have to accept your faith. But actually the access that was made for you and I is because God looked down at your heart and he said, you are acceptable to me. I accept you. I, God, accept you into my kingdom. Oh, hallelujah. And by having boldness and access. We can have confidence by faith that we are serving a God who's got our best interests in his mind. I know that's hard for some of you to accept. You can't hide it. I feel it while I'm preaching. I know this is a hard thing for some of us to accept, but I want you to remember, God is not your abusive uncle or daddy or cousin or aunt or nobody else. God is a person altogether to himself, and God is not here to be mean to you. He is not here to abuse you or mishandle you. I would to God, somebody help me preach right now. God is here for your best, for your betterment, for your good. He wants to see the best out of you and for you. How hard that is to accept that God is that way. 
Because we see him as such a holy being and we put him up in such a high place that we are out of touch with what kind of mind and heart he has for us. But God does not look down on us when we make mistakes and go, I knew it, stupid kid, dumb bratty thing, I knew you'd mess up. But he looks down, Brother Bram said like this, he said it's like he's looking at a child that's learning how to walk and stumbles a little bit and falls down. And he said God reaches down and takes him by the hand and picks him up like this, all right now son, try it one more time. And I love this. The prophet said, Brother Joseph, God does not whip us when we're trying to walk. Glory to God. Which means that if I am in a journey and I'm walking for the Lord and I mess up, he is so concerned for my next steps that he stops everything in my life to give me a chance to get up or be picked up. The devil could be in the middle of a full assault. Glory to God. Every gun a blazing. Every, every demon gun turned on your life. And the minute you fall down, God calls a ceasefire. Amen. Until you can stand back up again. Amen. Glory to the Lamb of God. Look at this in Hebrews chapter 3 verse 5. The Bible said, of course, that a builder, man builds the house and God built his own. He said, but Christ as a son over his own house, whose You think you're a shouter? You don't even realize that's where you got your shouting from. It's from the main shouter out of heaven. <laughs> glory. You think you can holler glory to God and hallelujah? Our God can shout so loud. He can cause the heavens to shake and the thunder to roll and the earth to go in the cloud. For, for, amen. In the castration. Hallelujah. God can rattle this whole world apart with a good hearty amen. You think you're the only one that likes to clap your hands? God ordained every tree that's ever been for 6,000 years to clap his hands. He is a choice chief shouter. Where do you think I get it from? It's a trait from my daddy. Hallelujah. He loves to worship. Where do you think that, that worship, that fellowship comes from? Look at Jesus when he was standing here on the earth. He was raising, oh, Father, I thank you. Creator of heavens and earth. Oh, in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12, now I said, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily. While it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Listen to this. For we are made partakers of Christ. If if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. So if you do not have a confidence that you have been accepted, then there is no rejoicing, there is no boldness, there is no shamelessness, there is no fearlessness, there's only fear. And that's why if you've got that in your heart tonight, you ought to not just walk, you ought to run to this altar and start asking God, take this out of my heart right now. If there be any evil in your heart. Isn't this what John said just a little bit ago? When he said that if you go before God and your heart condemns you, God can't answer your prayer. If there be anything evil in your heart, it will harden you through the deceitfulness of sin and the deceitfulness of the hour. Glory to God. Amen. But if you've got a heart that's absolutely right before God, you can have confidence. Not just for today. Not just for yesterday. But forever and ever. Our confidence will remain in Him. Steadfast unto the end. Remember, it's not he that starts the race, it's he that finishes it. Amen. Notice the next article. We cannot draw back from him. Like I've said this to you before here at the tabernacle, but whenever you take a little dog that's been abused, and you go to pet it, it'll kind of jump away from you a little bit because there's a fear there that's going to get hit. You know that's the way some people are when it comes to the Holy Ghost? When the Spirit of God goes to moving in a service like right now, 
And some of you sitting there feel the Holy Ghost move on you. And there's a little part of you that wants to holler out, Hallelujah! Why do you hold back? Why? Well, I figure we're going to get a little bit of a staring contest. That's all right. I'm better at it than you are anyhow. Huh? Why do you hold back? Fear. Fear of rejection. Fear that if you shout too loud, you might mess up tomorrow and mess your shout up today. And don't you know what that is? That is nothing more than the devil right. trying to keep you from enjoying the joy of knowing that you've been accepted in the beloved. Oh, I wish somebody help me preach right now. Why you hold back is that fear. Well, what if I mess up? What if I do something? What if you do? So what? That's why the blood of Jesus Christ was shed. And it's an inexhaustible fountain life. You can mess up again and again and again and again. I don't care how many times you mess up. Amen. There's always another dip at Calvary for those that need another dip. All you got to do is step in the water. But why are we afraid? Oh, well, I'm tired. No, no, that ain't it. Because you can be as tired as it gets. Let one of your buddies call you on the telephone or let somebody Instagram you or, hello. Let that little phone go. It can be three o'clock in the morning and you'll reach the grab. Who in the world is that? Tired ain't got nothing to do with it. Oh, you know, I, I just, this, I know what it is. It's shame. It is shame that we have harbored in our heart. We have harbored such shame on the inside of us that we cannot act like a child has liberty to act. That we cannot rejoice like a child has liberty to rejoice. Oh, but I want to tell you something tonight, believers, tabernacle. Amen. God wants to wipe all that shame out of your heart tonight that you can cut loose in the freedom and the joy of being accepted as a child of the living God. Well, Brother Ben, I, you know, I'm just not a noisy person. Really? Well, you mean if your grandkids kick that soccer goal, you mean you don't cut loose? Oh, I get it. You're a quiet nature person. Oh, you just don't say a lot. Oh, okay. All right. I get it. Well, Brother Greg, if you don't mind, get me one of them big carpenter hammers, will you? And we'll have a meeting after church. You quiet folk, come back to the office there and offer up the right hand to fellowship. I will take said hammer, place it upon said thumb, very hard. And if you don't squeal, then you got a right to be quiet in church. Otherwise, you are just making excuses. Because the devil has caught you with fear. He has filled your heart with fear and with shame. And he's tried to reproach you and your own self and tell you you're not worthy and you can't do it. Amen. But that is only the fear of being rejected. But if you can open your heart tonight and say, oh God, accept me in the beloved. Accept me as a child of God. Fill my heart with a revelation that I am yours and you are mine. Then God will allow you to let go tonight in a way you've never let go in your life. But as long as we hold on to guilt and shame, we cannot, we will always draw back from the moving of the Spirit of God. Don't ever quench the moving of the Spirit. You folks sitting here tonight, if you want to get closer to God, don't, don't quench Him when He moves on you. I don't care how insignificant you think it is. Maybe you just feel in your heart, raise your left hand. You better get that hand up there. Because every move of God in your life is significant. Let's just take it like this. If you were completely, absolutely backslidden tonight, sitting on a bar stool, and you felt the tiniest, most insignificant, little bitty nudge of God say, get right. Wouldn't that be something? Wouldn't that be enough for you to grab a hold of that and say, oh God, don't let, let me fan the flame of this ember until it grows out into true deliverance. Well, we would say that about an absolute stone cold backslider, but what about you and I sitting here tonight? When the blessings are laying right, all we have to do is reach up and get them. But we draw back. Why do we draw back from that? When you hear preachers preach and they are laying the promised land of God before you, and that old fella, he's eating so many grapes, he's got slobber all over him. And then he preaches, I don't know, he's slobber. You want to bite? That's not the time to go, uh, well, uh, 
You know, the last time I got fanatical like this, boy, I sure got in trouble with the devil. That ain't the time to draw back. That's the time to jump in with both feet. Woo. Praise God. We cannot draw back from him. Oh, listen to this. The Bible said here in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 35 again, Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which hath great recompense of rewards. So our confidence gives us great reward at the end. For you have need of patience that after, after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Now that just shall live by faith, not by works. My works express my faith, but I don't live by my works. Just because I can do right, think right, and be right doesn't mean I am right. Praise the Lord, church. Amen. It doesn't mean that I'm right with God. Just because I know how to go through the motions, I live by faith. Right. But if any man draw back, the word here means to be timid, to shrink, or conceal. Now, if you were a pauper and Donald J. Trump was going to walk in this building tonight, those entourage and the Secret Service and everybody walk right up this aisle and stand right here at the platform and say, come shake my hand. Now, let's say that you were a crook, a criminal, and you've defrauded the government. What are your, what your behavior would look like walking up before the President of the United States? That is assuming they know everything about you. They know you're a crook. They know you're this. They know you're that and the other. Donald can see right through you. And sometimes I'm almost sure that's probably about right. Anyhow. But whatever these things go. And you're standing there before the president of the United States. And he knows what kind of person you are. You're going to approach him with a little bit of a. Mr. President. You're going to be timid. You're going to to shrink. You might even conceal your face. Put a hat on. Pull it over your eyes. Well friends why do you think criminals do what they do? Right. They don't want to be caught. I want you to listen to me. If you are a child of God, when you approach your father, you do not have to conceal. You do not have to shrink. You do not have to be timid. You can walk right up to him and say, Lord, I've got a need today, Lord. You don't have to beat and slam and holler and scream and jump and carry on and beg. If you are a son, you just walk right up to him. You are my father. I give you my respects. I love you. I respect you. I appreciate you. And I have a need, daddy. Glory to God. But why do we draw back? The fear of being rejected. My, listen to this. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition. But of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We cannot be fearful, the next, the next uh, uh, article here, we cannot be fearful of standing on his promises. Now, listen to this, what Brother Bram said. Let me rest you a little bit. He says in Jehovah Jireh, now that that's right, if Jesus will come to this platform and in these people and will produce the same kind of life and do the same kind of things he did here on earth, will you accept him for your needs? Will you raise your hand to him and say, I will accept him for my need? He said, all right, the Lord bless you. Now, Brother Bram, aren't you afraid to make that kind of a statement? I'll let you answer it. Well, wasn't Brother Bam afraid that God was going to remember he lied? Or that he failed to go out when he first was called in Pentecost? Wasn't he afraid that he took that gun and tried to kill those boys for killing his dog? Why did Brother Bam have fear? Because he had a confidence that what the angel of the Lord told him. If you get the people to believe you, nothing, glory to God, that angel of the Lord is still here today. Nothing will stand in front of your prayer, not even cancer. So because he had no fear of being rejected, Brother Cameron, what did he do? He said, if he's here, let's see him do it. Why do we draw back from such things? Why don't we stand when the devil's attacking our home? Why do we have to get in such emergency mode? Now, don't y'all look at me like that. I live a human being life just like y'all. Y'all ain't sawdust. You're in the same shape I get in. Whenever trouble hits you, you get in emergency mode. Oh, oh, uh, uh, Brother Joseph's out of town. Who, who am I going to call? Uh, uh, brother, no, Brother Force is busy. Oh, no. Oh, uh, Brother Pat's gone. Oh, oh no. Uh, maybe Brother Jonathan. Oh, 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 oh
Why do we get in such emergency mode? The fear of being rejected. Church, if you knew who you were, when trouble hits your home, you ought to have enough confidence in your walk with God to say, I don't need to call nobody unless God puts it on my heart to do so. I am a son of God. I am a daughter of God. And I am going to meet this devil head on. Glory to God. We cannot be fearful of standing on his promises. Glory. Why? Because he promised he would do it. And God will keep his word. My Lord Jesus. My. He said, no sir. He promised He promised it. No matter anything contrary to it. I say it's a lie. Glory. God said so. That settles. He said it's a gift. And by yielding yourself to the Spirit of God. Again, here you hear Brother Branham said, somebody said to me one time, Brother Branham, aren't you afraid? No, sir. Just as the eagle. Oh, I love this. I feel and know the Holy Spirit is here. And I know that he called me to do this. I have not one fear. Friends, I don't mind telling you, when we as the people of God can arrive at this spot, look out, devil, here she comes. Do you know what we're waiting on? Get this out of your mind that the bombs are going to start falling and the calf is going to take away our cars and our, they're going to freeze our ass. Get that nonsense out of your mind. That'll happen in the tribulation. The bride won't see none of that. You know what God's waiting on? For us to get a little gumption, a little ambition. To start taking the proverbial bull by the horns. And say, so, all right. Just like with Shamgar. Shamgar got tired. Brother Ben talked about them Philistines. said they looked like big fat potato bugs coming over the hill. <laughs> Glory to God. He said they come up over that hill and all of a sudden they come down and take Shamgar. Shamgar looked down and said, I'm sick of it. I have had enough. Amen. But don't you see the size of them Philistines? I don't care. Because you see when a man is ready to die. He don't have much fear about what happens tomorrow. That's right. Preach it. And when you and I ha- know that God has got our back. The Lord. Glory to God. Some of y'all ain't going to pull no matter what I do, aren't you? You ought to jump in with both feet now. I'm trying to hand off these big grapes to you. Come on. Amen. That's right. Now watch. Oh, he said, I feel the Holy Spirit is here. No, he's called me to do this. I have not one fear. Why? It's his work, not mine. I have nothing to do with it. It's your faith touching God. <laughs> you know, but when the devil shows up, it's like, oh, oh, oh. I got a ball cup. I got to get ready to have some faith. Faith is just relaxing and saying, God, you said so. I've got confidence that what you said will be that way. Come on, somebody help me now. Whatever the word says, that's what he said he'll do. And I know he's promised it. Faith is not trying to work yourself up. What are you doing, Brother Ben? I'm trying to get faith going. Got to get my motor oil warmed up. I got to get faith running. Faith is just simply relaxing and believing what God said. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We cannot be fearful of standing on his promises. Look at this. People fear, the next article, people fear the unknown. Watch this, Brother Brandon said, faith by experience. He said, now, usually we find people are afraid to accept it. And usually, people who have faith is someone who has experienced faith. So when you know he's done it once, you got confidence he'll do it tomorrow and the next day and 10 years from now and 100 years from now. If I live to be 150 with Alzheimer's, I've got confidence in my soul that God will do what he promised. Praise God. Praise the Lord. I can't, I can't be afraid. I mean, even if I get afraid physically in my flesh or get scared or whatever, I, if I've got confidence in my soul that God loves me and he's got my back, I cannot be fearful. Amen. I just have to say, I don't know what the unknown is. And God, unless he reveals it to me, I don't know what tomorrow holds. But there is a secret to this. Brother Branham said the reason David was the man he was is because he committed his futures to Almighty God. So maybe I don't know what tomorrow is, but if I commit commit the one that is tomorrow, because you see, before you get to tomorrow, God's already there. (laughs) He's already waiting on you. 
He was waiting on you tomorrow today. Glory to God. And Amazon thinks they're fast. They ain't got no drone that can touch that. Woo, glory. Because God is absolutely the unset. He is the unsilent. He is the quiet. He is the hidden. Sometimes completely. You're blind. You just don't. Well, God, are you? Are you? But yes, remember. Even though he may be completely silent. He said, I will never leave you. And I will never forsake you. I will always be with you. He didn't say we'd always feel him. He didn't say we'd always be able to sense him. But he said, I would always be there. Mm, glory to God. Hallelujah. Which means he cannot leave my side. He will not leave my side. And he does not leave my side. Mm. Next article. I love this one. People fear messy. Now, sister, don't look at me this way. You worked on your hair quite a long time for coming to church to make sure it wasn't messy. <laughs> Brothers, you did too. Shake your head this way. People fear messes. We are creatures of control. Can I say it this way? We are, by nature, control freaks. And the church said, oh my, amen, right. We are. We want to control every aspect of our life. So when things get messy, we get terrified. Well, well what's, what's going on? I don't know. You know, we want, we want to do something for the Lord. You know, we want to serve the Lord. But when we say we want to serve the Lord, we mean in the capacity of serving God when everything is calm, when everything is right. But listen, brother, if you want to serve God, it isn't over here on the sideline. See that battlefield over yonder that's got about 400 dead soldiers on it? There's bombs bursting every direction. There's gun parts laying everywhere and body parts laying everywhere. And trees are blown to bits. And there's big old holes in the ground. Smoke up everywhere. Make you sick to your stomach with the smell of burning flesh. Anybody still want to do something for the Lord? Because that's where it's at. In the messy. Glory to God. Listen, this is a message wide. But they said, afraid of the new birth. What makes it? In other words, what are they afraid of? Because it's kindly messy to them. That's why some people don't want to really get born again in the Holy Ghost. They might cry and a tear might run down their cheek. Oh, be still, my soul. Well, I, if, I got this, if I really got to baptism, I wouldn't want to shout and jump and holler and I enroll and carry on. Well, if you're afraid of the messy, you'll never walk into the, into the accepted. Because only in the accepted is where the messy lay. And God takes the messy and turns it into the beautiful. He makes all things beautiful in his time. I got news for you. Sometimes God will make your life messy. But it is all for your benefit. You say, well, how's this beneficial? Because God wills it to be that way. You want to serve the Lord? Okay. Kind of like that boss that time in the city wanted to get saved, and then the slave jumped out there in the middle of the hog pen and said, Out ah, here he is, boss. Come on out here. Well, I didn't want to get the Holy Ghost in Asia, but that's where the Holy Ghost is at. In the messy. Woo, my Y'all y'all just run out of amens over the weekend. Boy, but y'all brothers had a wonderful time Sunday service. I, you just lost all your amens tonight. Hmm. Amen. Wonder what makes it that way. Oh, am I making things a little messy? Sorry about that. Preaching does that, though. Notice this next article here. A ra radical fanaticism creates fear for the moving of the Holy Ghost. Now, there's another side of this where Brother Man says here in True Sign Over Luke. He said, keep yourself from fanaticism. Don't get worked up in emotion. He said, that's what brings so much radical stuff and makes people afraid of it. Is because the radical fanaticism. So when it comes to real, genuine moving of the Holy Ghost, let it be genuine. Don't just be radical. Well, if I'm going to get saved, I, I got to do certain things. No, you, all you got to do is yield yourself. That's it. Just, yield, just say, God, I'm here. I'm lost. I need you to save me. That's it. And then wait on him to do the work. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Come on. In the message, we don't believe that. Hey, friends, I say it here on the internet, around the world. I'm not ashamed to say this. In the message, we think there's something we got to do to be saved. That's error. There is nothing you can do to be saved. The Bible tells, I would just say it like the Bible said it. No man seeks God. So if you're here, you didn't seek him. Right. 
So don't be a fanatic. Brother Bam said in the seals, don't try to be odd. Friends, this is the reason why people start talking to you about a message and a prophet, and you start seeing them do that sidestep thing. <laughs> it's because a lot of times, if we're not careful, we come across like a bunch of nuts. We start talking a bunch of stuff, and we haven't even introduced Jesus Christ to him yet. And we're talking about, about angels on a mountaintop. Come on. Woo! Come on, church. Come on. you got to start breaking them in the right way. you got to break them in in a way to where that they can walk in truth and be illuminated to truth little bit by little bit by little bit. Nobody just dumped at your lap and said, here it is. God took you little piece by little piece by little piece by little piece. Right. Now, look at this next article. I love this. The future belongs to you. He not only gives you a future home, but he gives you a future. That's a whole lot more than the world can offer you, brother. Yes, sir. Now, when he preaches to us the future home of the heavenly bridegroom, we just look at the future home. We don't really see the future part. If there was no future you, there would be no future home. So in effect, by God giving a future home means he gives you a future. It's a whole lot more than Nashville can offer you. You're hot today, tomorrow you're not. You're their favorite singer, you're their American Idol, you're this, that, and the other, and then by next week they got somebody a whole lot better than you. Huh? There's no future in that stuff. Oh, I'll go into stocks and trading this, that, oh, you don't, there ain't no future in that kind of thing. You might be, I read just uh, some articles the other day about billionaires. And I was, I was amazed how many billionaires living on top of the world in an overnight time lost everything they had. That's no future. Oh, I'll marry so-and-so. I'll, I'll be so-and-so's husband or so-and-so's wife or I'll go to so-and-so's church or I'll send at so-and-so's ministry. There's no future in none of that. God is the one that gives you a future. Oh, I'll go to such and such school. I'll get a certain, certain degree. There's no future in any of that kind of stuff. Don't believe that? Look at Donald Trump University. <clears throat> Anyhow, <laughs> there's no future in some of these things. But God not only gives us a future home, he gives us a future. Look at this, St. John chapter 14, verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you I go to prepare a place for you. You. Now look at this in the future. Home of the man said, help us, Lord. He said, oh, there, there's one here that's called to this wedding and supper of the Lamb. This thousand years of millennial reign. Then to enter into the city after the honeymoon is over. The millennium is merely the honeymoon. Then she, the bride, the bridegroom takes his bride home. Glory. It's hers, her bridegroom, his bride. And he's gone to prepare a house since he has become engaged. So God just doesn't want to give you a future home. He wants to give you a future. The next article. He is a rewarder of your work. Now, let's just skip through some of this to conserve time. That would be Matthew chapter 25, verses 20 and 21. When he speaks about the talents. And after you're faithful with the talents and gain more talents, he says, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Next article, his kingdom is joy and peace. That's Romans chapter 14, 17. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. So if you ain't got joy, it is only because you fear being rejected. But if you ever get that revelation in your heart that you've already been accepted, it is joy and peace and the Holy Ghost. Not just at Louisiana, not just at BYC, not just at some banquet from some place here or there, not when some special preacher's in town, not at special meetings or fall festivals, but every day of your life can be joy and peace and the Holy Ghost. Watch this again. God wants you to have hope. That's Romans chapter 15 verse 13. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. Glory. That you may be abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. God wants you to have hope. Notice again. God sends you helpers of your joy. That's what I am here tonight. A helper of your joy. 
2 Corinthians 1, 24, not that we, uh, for that we have dominion over your faith, Paul said, but are helpers of your joy, for by faith you stand. So why'd you come to church tonight? Why do I holler, come on somebody? Why do I say, don't run out of amens? Come on, I'm trying to help your joy. I'm trying to be a helper to your joy and get you out there in the promised land, get another stalk of grapes over your shoulder, amen, and get you walking in the promise of the word. Amen. Look at this in Elijah. Brother Abraham said, now everybody wants to be loved. I tell you the truth. He said, I do. I want God to love me. And I want the people to love me. That's exactly the truth. And if God loves me, then the people will love me. And if I love his people, he said, then he will love me for doing it. God would rather I love you than love him. That's quite a statement, isn't it? Helpers of Joy. In Galatians 5.22, the Bible said he has fruits, which is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, and faith. And the next article is, he is long-suffering. God is not impatient. God isn't sitting around waiting for you to make that final mistake. He is long-suffering. Oh, hallelujah. James chapter 5, verse 7. Be patient, therefore, brethren, under the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it. Touch your neighbor and tell him, I'm glad he's waiting on you. (laughs) Amen. He hath long patience for it. Watch until he receive the early and the latter rain. God has long suffering. He is willing to wait on you. Amen. Praise the Lord. Watch this. Now, the joy of being accepted. That's Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 through 7, where he says, To the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. This word accepted is highly favored. The same as Luke chapter 1, verse 28, when he said to Mary, Hail Mary, thou art highly favored. Glory, for the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Thee are you all. Are accepted. You are honored. You are favored. You are welcome. God has made a future. He wants you to have hope. He sends you helpers of your joy. Why don't we grab a hold of it? Because we're afraid of being rejected. Oh, but why don't you ask God tonight? God, drop in my heart the revelation that you accept me. I am favored. I am honored by you. And then the last article, God wants us to rejoice together. Luke chapter 15, verses 3 through 10. The woman with the coins in her head. She loses one coin. To do so means she was an adulteress. You realize? She had to have all of them coins in there, which represent the fruits of the Spirit, represents her virtue, her character, what she was. If she'd lose even one of them, she would be considered an ill-famed woman when the husband would return. But watch this. Hey, man. Oh, my. Let's see. Three, four, five, six, seven, and eight, and nine. Verses nine. When she hath found it. I love this. She calleth her friends and her neighbors together. That's why you're here tonight. Hey, Amen. We've called you together into the house of the Lord. Why? Are you here not to molly grub, not to sit there with a frown on your face not to sit there wondering if God's going to throw you in hell but you have been assembled tonight you are cordially invited to rejoice with me amen God said I want you to rejoice rejoice with me amen for he said I have found the peace which I had lost likewise I say unto you there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repents brother Branham said there's such joy that the angels of God started hollering and screaming and praising the Lord Oh, my angels that have never smoked, never cursed, never drank, never done one thing wrong, nothing but absolutely perfection. But when you come home, glory, when you step into the reality of who you really are, there is joy, not just on the earth, but heaven begins rejoicing. You say that sounds strange to me, does it? When John saw that book come open... And them seven seals are being claimed by the Lamb. And he started rejoicing and shouting. Remember it? He said, not only he on the earth, 
But everything under it, Brother Greg, everything above it, everything that was in heaven. And when John started worshiping, what the Bible say? The four and twenty elders which were gathered around the throne of God, they fell on their face and began to worship God too. Amen. You think you're the only one? When I say, come on somebody, you start coming on. No, there's dimensions out there full of angels and saints everywhere. And when I start rejoicing, when you start rejoicing, they start rejoicing. But we're afraid of being rejected. Whether we want to admit this or not, this is one of our biggest problems. When it comes to everything in the word of God, we're fearful that God is going to reject us. But the principle of this parable is no matter what you lose, you'll find it where you lost it. Glory to God. All you got to do is start looking. If you have lost your love, if you have lost your joy, if you have lost your peace, if you have lost hope, if you have lost anything at all, amen, God is telling us you can find that which you have lost. Why? Because you're not a servant. You're not just somebody just free for all and out there in the world, but you are a child of God. And by being a child of God, you can rightfully redeem back whatever it is that you have lost. Oh, thank you, Lord. Listen, this is the message of second coming of the Lord. Now, she had a house cleaning time. (laughs) She scrubbed the floors, swept the walls, took down the cobwebs. Not like Sam and I the other night. We come in here to clean the church. I was sweeping and doing all sorts of things. And Samantha said, hey, hold on a second. This place looks pretty clean. She wrote somebody and said, hey, is it clean? I said, yeah, this morning. I said, well, praise the Lord. Gets a double portion a little bit. (laughs) But I was sweeping them walls out there and turning them upside down, thinking about this woman with this lost coin. I thought, how pitiful it is. People in this message, when they lose their prayer life, they just kind of do like some of the modern people do nowadays when it comes to cleaning. Go, oh, it's too hard. <laughs> I said to one of these young people some time ago, we was at a certain place, young people's meeting, we all had to clean up. I handed a vacuum cleaner to him, and he said, what's this for? I said, you vacuum with it. Why? I said, oh, God, somebody's a mama's boy, sure as a world. I said, you've never run one of these? No. So I flipped the switch on, picked it back, started showing him how to do it. After about five minutes, he goes, is my arm supposed to hurt like this? <laughs> That reminds me about the way it is some Christians. You go to laying out the word of God to them. You preach to them joy. You preach to them faith. A faith that can move mountains. Amen. And you hand them all the scriptures in the world. That's got the ability to uncover where that devil is taking your rightful property from. And they just get so wore out. Well, I prayed a few minutes and I just get gnarly. I started praying and the devil said, bless his holy name, that I probably wouldn't get what I lost. Don't you realize? That's why the devil's telling you that. It's because... Because once you start fighting, you are on the verge of winning. Hallelujah, hallelujah. No matter what he tells you, keep on going. Why do we stop the fear of being rejected? What I'm trying to tell you tonight, friends, is that God cannot reject you if he's already accepted you. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Listen to this. I love this right here. The message of the man said, God, if I know my heart, he said, I'm not a hypocrite. I feel, he said, God, that everyone at this altar, here around this altar, has accepted, been accepted in your sight. I feel it by the witness of the Holy Spirit. They're now safely, their names are on the book. Watch this. Angels are singing. The bells of heaven are ringing. Satan is defeated. Glory to God, Brother Jonathan. Oh, listen to this. My, he said those devil seas are moving down the corridors of hell with their black flags are draping. Oh, my. The angels has gone to heaven to rejoice around the throne where mothers and fathers are waiting to hear the message come back from the meeting tonight. They got boys and girls sitting up there with them. Loved ones has gone on and waiting. And the angels are coming back and they're describing it. See, watch what he said. They're describing. Yes, they walked up humbly. 
They come humbly, not stiff and starchy, but they come broken hearted and weeping, you see? Because to be able to communicate with the dead is necromancy. And the Bible called that witchcraft. We cannot communicate with those that have went on beyond the curtain of time. But remember, the angels of God have access to Jacob's ladder. Glory to God. They can come to the earth and go back to heaven, go to heaven, come back to the earth. Amen. And when a daughter of God, a son of God, maybe it's an old grandma that prayed for 40 years that Junior would get his heart to God and receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Well, one day Junior gets saved and receives the Holy Ghost. And what do the angels do? Pack the message back to Grandma. You should have saw them. They cried. They wept. They got really born again. Now, if this is your grandmother in an 18-year-old body and she's standing around the throne of God and she gets the message that her prayers have been answered... You reckon she's going to sit there like some of y'all been sitting on me tonight? Oh, Brother Ben's preaching again tonight. He's going to want us to participate. No, not really. It's God wants you to participate. i just like to see you do it. Uh, you mean to tell me that they gave their heart to God? Well, praise the Lord. I imagine that 18-year-old grandma, she probably looks over at some of them youngins around the throne and says, y'all better cut a, pra- cut a trail. <laughs> Woo! Because if they can look down in hell and see them devils are walking with their tail between their legs and their black flags are draping and they're saying we lost the battle, we lost the battle. Amen. There's weeping down in hell, but in the realms of glory, there's rejoicing going on. It's what it looks like when you get something from God. Just losing a coin strike celebration that tells you it don't take much to get them worked up up there down here you got to pump and prime and work and have 40 special singers and have 47 special preachers but up there somebody can just go whoo and the whole place just erupts right. oh, God I feel like you feel hey man I feel exactly what you're feeling glory to God I am convinced, Brother Eugene, that when we get to the other side and we are walking through the gates of heaven, we are going to have to wait a million years on God to get done shouting before we can line up and start meeting him. You think you've been waiting on glory? Not nearly as long as he has. Oh, amen. He's had you in his mind all this time. He's been waiting on you to walk through them gates of pearl all of this time. Imagine what it's going to be like when the queen of heaven makes her first ascension through the throne. He won't even be able to get one toe of Ephesus over that golden pearl. And God's going to be going, glory to God. Hallelujah. You'll see a blur go. Bam. Somebody say, who in the world was that? It's God. He's, got, he's just been so happy. He just saw Pergamus come through the gate. I know in your mind you probably think God's one of these guys. That, I am that I am. But God is animated, brother. God is passionate. God is charismatic. He can erupt out of himself so many emotions you would never be able to keep up. I know the time says me to shut up, but I'm just getting started. (laughs) Glory to God. Don't you realize all that we enjoy down here is an attribute, an attribute of what comes from his great heart. Why do you think so much rejoicing goes on up there? Because these angels has watched him unfold his plan for 6,000 years. From the very moment that he entered out of the self-existent stage into the pillar of fire and said, let there be light. Because remember, he tells us Christ is the mystery. The first thing God made in his opinion, he said, was angels. So them angels were standing there at the corridors of glory. When God said, let there be light, and a clinker went. And God said, whoa. Whoa. But the man said, what's he doing? Writing his first Bible. Yes. Putting every one of them stars in their Praise proper God. position. Because you see, every one of them stars had a place in his mind before the place was there for the stars. Glory to God, hallelujah, and praise the Lord. Hallelujah to God. Amen. Just like you and I, if you are in his mind, before there was a fin on a fish's back, there was water to put that fish in. 
And so as I with the bride, there's a place, a home, for you to be accepted in. St. John 4, 36, he that reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto eternal life. That both that he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. Amen. You might say, what is there for me to be happy about? All I did was sit in the pew tonight, Brother Ben. All I did when Brother Joseph preached, all I did was holler, amen. When Jonathan and Blake and these brothers, all I did, amen, Brother Roger, amen. That's all I did was say amen. Right. Amen. But without your amen... That might have been one little less drip of water. Right. One little bit of the atmosphere taken away from the true seed of life. Glory to God. So you're a man. Even though you may not have been the sower. You might have just been somebody that contributed a little sunlight. But what little bit you contributed to bring in the whole picture of it all. Jesus said not only will the sower, but the reaper and all the rest of them will rejoice together. When they see the plan of God. You may never get on a plane and go overseas. But if you send somebody or pray for somebody while they're there. Or help them in some way on the ministry field or missionary field. Like this church we support the missions here at this tabernacle. All of them dollars and all of them things and goodies and what more we send out. Amen. Throughout these different countries in the world. Everywhere we help the message go forth. Don't you realize that is so at the end of the day. Not one man stand up and get all the glory. But it's so all of us can rejoice together. We contributed to the economy of God. And all of us can rejoice. Amen. Praise the Lord. The fear of being rejected. And the joy of being accepted. Yes, Lord. Let's pray together, can we? Oh, thank you, Lord. As you heads are bowed tonight I just wonder you standing here are you one standing here tonight this is brother Ben in my heart I still have fear that God will reject me would you be willing to put all that underneath his blood tonight let it all fall away and just let him take it out of your heart if so would you raise your hand to the Lord say brother Ben that's me I've got a fear of being rejected. I don't want that. I don't want it anymore. God bless all your hands going up. Every single one of you, I see y'all. God bless your heart. Oh, praise the Lord. Now, some of you standing here tonight that you know you've been accepted, the beloved, and you've got confidence in what God's done for you. Why don't you reach over and take the hand of somebody standing next to you and let's pray for the other ones. As a body. You could come up here, sure, we could pray for you. But really as a body, we ought to be able to rejoice together, pray together. Let's ask the Lord to help us. Father, as hand is laid upon hand tonight, we're asking in the name of Jesus Christ that the Holy Spirit will come right down here in this place, come right through these hands that are believers. May you move down through every life, every heart, every soul. And God, may you drive out every speck of fear. Drive out everything that might be contrary to receiving that joy of knowing they've been accepted in the beloved. I pray you'll drive out every ounce of it tonight, Lord. God, may they receive a new lease on life. May tonight be the night, Lord, that things change. Lord, that the road is cleared and they're able to walk free in a new pathway. Grant it tonight, I pray, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Grant it, my Father, in Jesus' name. Now, if you believe it, raise your hands up, all of us now. Let's just worship the Lord together just a moment. Amen. Brother Roger, get us a song ready. Hallelujah. Let's just worship the Lord. Just accept it now. Say, Father, I'm receiving that revelation in my heart. The joy of being accepted. No longer am I going to fear rejection. I'm receiving your promised word tonight. Let's worship together as the brother sings. And shalom to the internet audience. God bless you. Till Sunday morning. Sunday school 10. Church regular service at 11. May the Lord bless your week. We'll see you on the broadcast. I'm not going to lead you. This coming Sunday. God bless you. Don't let me be afraid.